Parents expect schools to teach their children knowledge about the world and basic skills such as reading. But Natalie Wexler's recent book, The Knowledge Gap, makes the case that many American schools have abandoned the responsibility of teaching substantive content and that this rejection of the value of knowledge is exacerbating the nation's reading crisis. How should we evaluate the content poor approach that Wexler critiques? What are the effects of the trend that favors it? Do Wexler's criticisms of this trend and her warnings about its consequences go far enough? Welcome to New Ideal Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Sam Weaver. I'm a junior fellow at the Ayn Rand Institute. And with me today is Ilan Jarno, senior fellow at ARI. Hi, Ilan. Hi, it's good to be with you, Sam. I thought a good place to start is to mention, number one, this is an area you're researching and writing about education, and you have the Conceptual Education Fellowship to support your work, which we're really grateful for. So that's part of the interest we have in looking at Natalie Wexler's book. But I think the broader context is that there really is a problem in the education space, and some of what that looks like is recognized. But I think my perspective, and I mentioned if this is how you think of it too, is that as much as you, I don't think you have to convince people that education is in a bad state. A lot of people are concerned about it. My perspective is that their standards, as much as they recognize the problem, their standards are really low uh, relative to what education should be doing. So I'm curious how you think of it. What do you, maybe you could lay out some of the facts of what the state of education is and how it's perceived. Yeah, I think it's definitely not hard to convince people that there's a serious, serious problem in American education. I mean, one metric that uh, people talk a lot about is uh, widely recognized and, and for good reasons is a, uh, a survey that the federal or a, not a survey, a test that the federal government runs every three years called the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And they test uh, student performance at a variety of grade levels in a variety of subjects one that's relevant to what we're talking about today and really a, a central metric in showing the, the failures of the education system is the reading score. Uh, so in the most recent uh, assessment, which was released just a few months ago, uh, they found that 33% of fourth graders are reading at a proficient level. And lest you say that was just, that was COVID drop off and it would have been much better, in 2019, before COVID, it was just 35%. So it was a, a little higher before COVID, but not, not appreciably higher. And I think that number just in itself, which is consistently in the 30s like that, is obviously really horrible. That the, the schools are doing, they're trying to teach reading. This is one of the central things that they're trying to do. And what they're getting is about one third of students become proficient readers. Yeah, I, I want to just jump in because I, I get angry about this sort of thing, but I have two thoughts that I thought would be good to set up here. One is, imagine if you went to a hospital and the survival rate for anyone entering the emergency room was 35%. Survival rate, <laughs> okay? So you walk in with a broken ankle, okay, walking with a heart attack, okay, there's variation. Or what about you board a plane where the success of reaching your destination is 35%? All the other times it's crashing or it's falling apart or something really bad is happening. And it's the what's not happening that's important to think about as well. But the other thought I had is I wanted to ask you about this term proficiency because that seems like it a lot hinges on what does it mean for these lucky 33% or these these 33% who made it to that threshold, what does it really look like for to, to be counted as proficient by this test? Yeah, uh, so this is a this is just a measure of whether they think that you're a proficient reader, whether they think the student is is able to basically read a variety of different texts which they give them on the test and and you know answer some questions, do they understand what is being said? Can they, you know, draw some conclusions, do some basic analysis of the meaning of these texts? Um, but it, it is just a, a test of can you can you read and can you understand what you're reading uh, at a, at a fairly basic level? Um, and it, what is noticeable about this, I think, is that uh, if that's all that 
the schools accomplished. I don't think we think that would be nearly enough. I mean, I don't think that would be nearly enough. Uh, if even if they were getting to 95% on these, which they, of course, they're not getting anywhere, anywhere near that, this would not be a full education. It would be the basics. You've gotten the basics down, but what about all the other things that are part of a full education, the things that children should learn in order to live a full life, a productive life, a, a rich life. Uh, they need more than just being able to read and comprehend a, on a, on a fairly, uh, fairly basic level, certain passages from a test, right? They, they, there's so much more that an education should provide. And when we're looking at this as, you know, how are they doing on this, this reading assessment? It's important to keep the context that this is, this is the bare minimum or maybe below the bare minimum of what education should be doing, what a good school should be doing. And American schools are not even coming close to hitting this bare minimum. Yeah, I wish, I don't know as much as you, you've been reading more into this field than I have lately. It, my impression is that people just take this as, okay, well, this is a measure we have and proficiency is a valid metric and still it's a problem. So that people, but I, I wonder how much is this phenomenon of, this is a debased standard. It's very low. And if you ask me, what would I want from my children by fourth grade or whatever the, the point at which you test them for how well they're able to read. I don't think it would be enough, even close to enough to say they're proficient readers. I, I would want them to come to a place where they get so much out of reading that they want to do it. They choose to do it. Now I know kids, I mean, compared to when I grew up, there's, there's so many other things that can pull their attention away, but reading is such a fundamental uh, skill and a source of value and the, and the means to gaining new knowledge that I think the way I th think of the positive that you would want, and you would have to think about how to, to measure this, but it would have to be something like, there's a real love of learning, a real love of reading as a primary, and that kids, they, they're they capable, that it's a source of, of self, uh, they see themselves as competent to read and they, they gain satisfaction from it. And then it opens up the world of reading to them for fun and for, not just because the teacher assigned this book and we have to slog through it or, or have to do it in school, but just this self-driven desire to read and use their mind to gain new knowledge. And that, if, if I had to summarize how I think about some of this, it's one of the things I took away from reading and studying Ayn Rand uh, is that the appreciation for the role of the mind in human life. I mean, this is a big part of what she dramatizes in her novel, Atlas Shrugged. And it's a real issue. It isn't just a part of the fiction. It's, it's a fundamental issue in human life. And that this is, if you have the, an, an, some appreciation for why the mind is so important in life, it's a source of value, source of knowledge, it's a means of progress individually and then on a scale of a society, to look at education and say less than a third or a third of students are barely capable of reading. We're not even talking about the ones that are love, who, who, who've cultivated a love of reading by this age. That is such a a dismal statement about the state of the government run education system, but just the education uh, establishment and, and the, the people engaged in it, because that's looking, it's, it's a case of having your standards lowered for you without actually recognizing that that's happened. And then just taking for granted, well, this is where we are and it's still not good enough. Well, maybe the, the suggestion I would give is, let's really elevate our standards to where they should be, which is just a recognition of that this is a huge value. It's missed, it's, 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 there's so many lives squandered and so many lives, so much human potential that's going to waste as a result of this, that this puts a whole moral color to this issue that I think is often, it's not brought in enough. And I hope that in the course of the conversation that it will indicate a little bit of that. Um, so, so I wish, for people to take a perspective on this that is, imagine if there were 20 more Steve Jobs in the world or a hundred more Jeff Bezos or a hundred more Edisons and how much better would the world be? Well, how does that happen? People need to be able to use their minds and gain knowledge and learn and, and 
a key to that. So you put it as it's a fundamental skill. Yes, <laughs> there's no way around the fact that you, you can't function in a world like ours, which is so advanced technologically and in the scale of knowledge that's been gained so far, you can't function and succeed absent this crucial skill. So I, I think that's a missing piece in, in this uh, context. And I, I hope we can sketch that in a bit as we go. So let me let me put back the let me hand back the floor to you and tell us a bit about where does Wexler enter the picture? How does she come into this issue? What's her motivation? And give us a sketch of what the book's argument is. Sure. Uh, so she is uh, comes into this picture the way I think that a lot of uh, people who are concerned, critical of the educational system as it is and, and interested in reforming it and making it better, which is looking at how horrible the results are on tests like the uh, NAEP that I mentioned before, and looking at just how how little students learn, how how low their capacity to do again like the most basic things that school should be teaching them is. Uh, so she's she observes both. I think the fact that reading test scores results are terrible, abysmal. Uh, and also the fact that I think, which I think a lot of people sort of notice when you see like studies on what Americans know about the, their world, the, their political system, history, the fact that m many Americans are very ignorant about the world. They haven't learned very much in science, in history. You can ask them, what are the three branches of the U.S. government and a majority doesn't know or uh, what year was the... Uh, declaration of independence signed like these very basic things there's a real ignorance about these and she's you know looking at uh, what's going on in american schools and particularly in elementary schools and uh, what she argues is that uh, these problems uh, poor reading and uh, very limited knowledge are related issues uh, that the American schools have basically, and many of them have almost entirely abandoned teaching knowledge, facts, information about the world, and science and history and subjects like that. And that this uh, has a connection to the, uh, the failure also of many students to learn to read or read very well. Uh, so these, these phenomena are, are, she makes an argument that these are related phenomena. Um, and, you know, maybe, sorry, did you want to come in? I was going to say, so it seems like there's a sort of twin phenomena that she's relating and, and helping us see that they interact in a complicated way. Uh, maybe you could tell us a bit about where is the attention going in the schools if it's not to knowledge? Yeah, so she you know looks at studies on you know how are elementary schools spending their time, and she she spent a lot of time in various classrooms herself, and finds that almost all the day in elementary schools is on math and reading, uh, with science like science and social studies, history, those types of subjects get you know maybe a few minutes every few days just almost completely absent. It, it, the focus is almost entirely on these two subjects, math and reading, uh, which I think is is connected to the fact that this is what uh, standardized tests are looking for. This is what's emphasized in like, how are your reading scores? How are your math scores? Uh, so schools are really devoting themselves to just trying to hammer in on these subjects and excluding everything else. Of course, the problem is not only are you losing the value of the subjects, science and history and other things like that, but also they're not even succeeding in reading and math. I mean, you looked at the reading scores, you can look at the math scores from similar studies and tests, and you'll find those are also nowhere near where they should be. So we have a problem where the schools have tossed out the knowledge subjects and also in the, in the skill subjects of math and reading that they're doing, it, what they're doing is not working and they're not even coming close to succeeding even in those limited areas that they're focusing on. So I, I've, some people watching or listening to us may have heard about the so-called reading wars that 
reached a climax in the 1990s, but they've never really gone away. And the reading wars for people who aren't unaware of them were about the methodology for how to teach reading. And there, there were competing schools of thought and it, 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 they were called a war because people took sides and people, who, whether they had qualifications or not, they were weighing in. And part of what made it a sort of culture war type issue at the time, and it's still one, I think it's a valid reason to be uh, agitated about it, is that one reading is so important and two the results of one method versus another are they're life-changing that you, either you end up a competent reader or more than a competent reader or you're forever hobbled by inability to read well or just not reading at all or or, or just or, and then think about all the anxiety and, and the in, lack of confidence that that builds as as you go through life so maybe you can just flesh out where is she, where does she come into this is she how do you relate her to that so-called reading war does she have a position and how does that fit into her perspective yeah so the then this is a an a simplified ver version of what's going on in the reading wars but the two basic sides are the in call it for shorthand the phonics side and the whole language balanced literacy side and there's some vagary to what exactly is meant by those terms but wexler's definitively on the side of phonics which means essentially the side that says it's necessary it's crucial to teach children how letters connect to sounds and how you can combine those letters and sounds into words and that that's how reading works so if you have a uh, D-O-G on the page in front of you, you, the child needs to learn that the, that D makes the sound D, O makes the sound A, ah, G makes the sound G, and to be able to put those together to say D, A, ah, G, dog. The, the phonic side is that we need to teach those letter and sound correspondences, teach them systematically so it, there's a lot of instruction that helps the children associate those two and learn how to combine those into words and she emphasizes that this is necessary in order to uh to actually teach most children to learn how to read there are children who will a certain percentage of children will figure it out pretty much no matter what they is done but a majority of them need some kind of instruction and this is the kind uh, that she argues, and I think quite rightly, that they, they need. Uh, but she does think that this is not the whole issue. Uh, so there's this is necessary, but there's more that goes into reading than just uh, being able to, to you know, convert the letters into words. And that's sometimes called decoding. Because if you think that like written language is like a code, and you translate it into the familiar words of spoken language, that's phase one in her view but there's also the fact that you need to actually know what those words mean once you've figured out what they are i mean if if i read the sentence uh the dog played fetch i only that sentence only has any meaning to me because i know what a dog is i know what playing is i know what fetch is uh so i need to have the knowledge of what those words mean in order to actually make sense, in order for that thing to have any meaning to me. Otherwise, it's like if I learn how to pronounce a foreign language, uh, it, I don't, I, I'm not really reading if I can just sound out the words and have no idea what is actually being said. Uh, and so her view is we, we need phonics to teach decoding, but, and this she thinks is often neglected, knowledge is necessary for children to actually understand the things that they're reading. Okay, so I'm with you so far. Now, what is it that she's, so I think the subtitle of her book is the, the uh, sort of the unrecognized problem or the unappreciated problem, I forget exactly the wording. So what is she pointing to on the reading side that is, in her view, the, 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 the thing that we need to be more aware of, or the problem that connects to the lack of knowledge? Sure. Yeah. So the, the subtitle is The Hidden Cause of America's Broken Education System and How to Fix It. Uh, so yes, she argues that, so as we mentioned, the schools have basically dropped out or a, a lot of them have dropped out knowledge, content, learning information about the world from the curriculum. It's, it's taught very little or not at all. Uh, and if 
it's true that in order to understand what we're reading, we need to have certain knowledge that we're bringing to the text. Her argument is that because the schools are not teaching much knowledge anymore, that prevents students from being able to comprehend most of the things that they will read or be asked to read or just want to read in their lives. Uh, so if I have, here's, here's one example that really, I think really illustrates it is she refers to a scientific experiment, a study that was done uh, on children reading a little uh, passage that described a baseball game, right? And uh, some of the children were fans of baseball. They knew how the game works and some of them weren't. And what she found is that, or what the study found is that when the children who knew about baseball were able to read and understand the passage quite well because they knew the the language and the what was being referred to if they talk about a ground ball or a double play or a base hit the children understood that if they knew about baseball but if they didn't know anything about baseball they had a really hard time understanding what was going on in that passage well that doesn't just apply to baseball that applies to whatever you might be reading so if you have a child who wants to read a book about life in ancient Greece and they don't know anything about ancient Greece and they don't know anything about like world history and what life was like in different periods. And this book is assuming that they know something about that. They're going to really struggle because there's a lot of things that the, uh, that they need to know in order to make sense of what, what the book is telling them. And if this is true across, all areas of knowledge, if you have children who have learned very little about the world around them, their ability to read and understand texts is going to be limited pretty strictly to things that fall into the area, uh, their area of experience. And, uh, and part of what she says and why, why she calls this book the knowledge gap is that people are really concerned about, in education, they're concerned about the, the, the gap between uh, students who come from typically wealthy families and students who come from poor families, that the poor students perform much worse than the students from wealthier families. And her argument is that that is in large part a result of the difference in knowledge, because the children from wealthier families tend to have parents who will speak to them about things and, and they'll learn things from having conversations with their parents and they'll come to know a lot more about the world. And the poor students whose parents are working long hours and don't can't pay for them to have a lot of books or have private tutoring or things like that, they won't learn nearly as much about the world. Uh, although she argues that it's a problem, not it's not just a problem that affects poor students, it's a problem that affects all students just in different proportions, that the schools don't teach them about the world. And as a result, they can't read much of anything except for what falls within the things that they have experienced or have, have happened to hear about. When I was reading the book, uh, I think we've talked about this outside of the podcast in, in, in preparation and other contexts. One of the things that leapt out at me was her observations of classrooms. So she, as you said, she went to classrooms, she volunteered, and then she, in writing the book, she went to visit various classrooms to see what's being done. And she recounts a number of anecdotes of how teachers are instructing students in how to read. And, and, I, and I raise this because I think it, it's... It's not clear to me from her account how much is accidental, how much is deliberate, because some of it is clearly a, a, an expression of a certain theory about how to teach reading. And it's the idea that you can detach or disconnect reading skills, as they call them, this is her, their term, from content and what she's, I guess, calling knowledge and, and what's missing. So there's that theoretical perspective that this is, the, this is a feature, not a bug. Like you can disconnect the two and some of it, I think, seems like it's it's a failing of the schools that they don't, even if they were trying to teach knowledge, I don't know how well they would do it, but it seems like they're not really trying to do a lot with respect to certain subjects like social sciences and history and so forth. So th there's that question about, in, in just thinking through her argument, I, I don't have a sense for how, where she lands on that. It wasn't clear to me. But I, I did want you to tell me a bit more about, just to, I wanted to get your reaction to that the way that teaching instruction is done by, and I think this is valid, well-meaning teachers who are trained. So she didn't go to the worst schools. She went to schools that were, or at least classrooms that were well-run by competent teachers who 
have the student's best interest at heart, just to give a flavor of what actually happened so that we can get a, an understanding of why the reading portion is the way it is. Yeah, so it, it's natural to ask, if half the day is reading, what are they actually doing? Especially when you look at how bad it, the results are, what are they actually doing? Uh, so there is the whole issue of, uh, are they doing phonics instruction or are they doing a whole language type of instruction to get the kind of the basic mechanics of, of decoding or understanding what the, the words are. And in too many classrooms, it is still uh, a approach that uses a lot of whole language. Uh, but in some cases, there is, there is some phonics exercises that they're doing. So there's that aspect. But in regard to the issue of what's often called reading comprehension, that is understanding the meaning of the words once you've read them, uh, the dominant approach that, that she documents in, from her observation of classrooms is a, is a skills-based approach. So it's an idea that what needs to be done is children need to be taught a whole bunch of skills that they can use to understand any text that you put in front of them. So the idea is instead of teaching them specific content, they were going to teach them these skills and that's going to enable them to make sense of anything that they happen to read. So what kind of skills are we talking about? Uh, so these, are, these skills go under names like uh, identifying the subject, finding the main idea, uh, finding the sequence of events. And sometimes it can be things like finding the captions or reading a table of contents. And these are the, the type of thing that is a really dominant practice in the school. So they're doing exercises on how to find the main idea of something or what is a caption and can you write one? And the, whatever the content is for these, is, it's not, there's nothing systematic about like we're learning about the solar system. And so we're going to use books about the solar system. And it's not really like that. It's whatever books we happen to find, it's a passage here, a passage there. There's nothing systematic to the content because the focus is really on the method, on these little strategies or skills or techniques. And she gives some anecdotes, I think, that strike me as pretty absurd and, and very strange. Uh, so in the in the first chapter of the book, she talks about, uh, I, I believe it's a kindergarten class where the teacher was teaching the children about captions. And she was showing them all sorts of different books. She showed them a book about sharks and a plant, a book about the solar system and was asking them to figure out what part of the book is the caption. And she kept giving them the definition. It's the words that tell you what's in the picture and trying to get them to internalize that and be able to find the captions in the, in the book. And uh, what, I mean, it's, I think it's strange in a lot of ways to think that that's the most important thing that a kindergartner needs to do is to be able to say that's a caption and that's not a caption. But another thing that really struck me about that example is that the problem she, the teacher was having in getting them to study the captions was that they were interested in the content. The children wanted to read about the solar system and they wanted to learn about sharks and that's what they that's what was drawing their attention and she kept redirecting their attention back to can we label what a caption is it, which part of the page is the caption and this is this struck me as very strange and there are some other ones that she gives i'll, I'll give one one other one is uh, a skill that was in a second grade class she observed uh, where they were supposed to be figuring out the topic of a book and the teacher was showing the students how to figure out topic. And they were reading this, this book that was about the horses, the wild horses on uh, Shinkatigue Island in the, uh, in the shore of Virginia. And uh, the teacher was trying to get them to learn to, that they should figure out the topic of a book by basically flipping through the pages and skimming the words and finding which word they saw most often. And that's the topic. And that's supposed to help them understand what they're reading somehow, that they, they've learned how to figure out the topic. And there's all sorts of other ones of these skills some, that I mentioned. And these are the way in which they're supposed to, according to this method, learn how to uh, understand anything that they're reading, because I guess they're meant to apply these skills when they are presented with something new. I'm, I'm taking a standardized test and I have this new passage. I'm going to skim for the words and find the topic. Uh, but it's all about these little like kind of strategies, gimmicks, ways of 
trying to break things down with the focus all being on that and not on the content of what they're actually reading about. The two examples you gave, are, those are vivid in my memory from the book. And what makes it, you said it's bizarre. I'll go further. I think it's an outrage because the children just want to know about Mars. Is this Mars? Is this the moon? Which planet is this? And what is a planet? And how, where? I want to see it in the sky. And they're, they're really, or the shark example, they want to know about sharks. And why do these creatures not have legs? And how do they breathe underwater? And the, the, clearly, there's a desire for knowledge. And what I find outrageous is a well-meaning teacher following the instructions she's been trained in is telling is redirecting those active eager minds towards something that on its face makes no sense at all as a means to gaining understanding of what's in the book and it, it uh they're calling it a skill and maybe by some definition this is a skill i don't this is not my experience of reading and i don't think i, I would find it useful if i were in that position there there are a couple of threads here i want to pull on and just talk talk through with you so one is to go back to this idea of disconnecting reading from content and, and so this this is a feature of the theory or the, or the particular approach that's being implemented and connecting that with the observation earlier about if you give children something to read where they don't have the knowledge for it whether because they're so young they would not have learned it like you give them a, a, a an article about some bill in Congress. Okay, the, their five-year-old is not in a position. Maybe he knows a bit about government versus they haven't been taught what a five-year-old should know by this age. So put aside why they don't have that knowledge. Um, why would they give a child something that for whatever reason they don't know about, why would they give them something like that? So take the one about the ponies. I've never heard of this island. And I remember the example from the book. I've never heard of these ponies before. I don't know why I would be interested in these ponies. Why I, as an, a, a, an adult, would have any interest in this is a separate question. But uh, Or baseball. I couldn't follow the example you gave about baseball because I don't follow baseball. I've never, I think I've been to one game in my, maybe two games in my life. And I, someone explained it the whole time. Um, so, but if I were given something to read like that, the first thing I would say is, I, Okay, I, why am I reading this? What's the context and so forth? So if I were to crystallize this into a question or an observation for you to react to, it's how much do you think is going on here? This is going on because there's, a, there's no awareness that children should know certain things and that it's only engaging, it would only be engaging for them if this is something that either they're going to learn about or they already have some inkling of, and they would be at their level of knowledge. Like it, it, it's a match. So you wouldn't give them Dostoevsky as a bedtime story, but you might give them Harry Potter as a bedtime story because they can relate to it and it's going to stretch them. So they don't have to know everything that's in there, but it, versus something that's way beyond their capacity in terms of life experience or even uh, what you might expect from them. So, so I guess I, to summarize it, it's, how much is, go is this perspective pushing teachers to disregard the whole issue of what's age appropriate in terms of reading? And age appropriate, we can say they should teach them some of the history and the knowledge that is background, but sort of separate those two. I'm just curious your view on that sort of age appropriateness and how much of that is a factor. Yeah, uh, so part of the issue here is that there is no such thing as reading without reading something, right? To be reading, you're reading, you have to be reading something. But there's a real antipathy to in this, in this, behind this perspective, to the idea that content is what matters, that there's specific content that children should learn at any given time, that there's knowledge that they should have. There, the view of this movement, it, it, to put it in the most charitable light is that uh, you're going to teach method. They're going to learn the method of reading and understanding. And then whatever content they want to read about in the future, they can just apply that method and they'll be able to make sense of it. So I think there really is a, a, a view. I mean, if you have the view that the content is not what's important, the content doesn't matter, 
uh, then the question when it comes to, okay, we're making this standardized test. We need to have some passages on it so we can test their reading. What are those passages going to be about? Uh, and what kind of passages should we choose and what kind should we leave out? The selection criteria, it, it becomes hard, I think, to have a reasonable, a, a rational way of selecting what's going to be on and what's not going to be on. I mean, there are some things that are obviously out, uh, like Dostoevsky, they won't think that, get confused and think Dostoevsky should be on there. But it becomes, I think, a matter of uh, how complicated do we think the vocabulary is and how complicated do we think the sentence structures are? And then we want to have a variety of subjects. And then there's concerns that uh, some of the subjects might be, this is a kind of recent hot button concern is some of the subjects you select for a standardized test might be culturally biased in some way mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. students from a certain cultural background might be more familiar with it than others uh there, there's this uh but it's not about what a third grader is expected to know or expected to have learned because the view is that there shouldn't be an expectation of this is what we teach in third grade and this is what we teach in second grade and these are the things that they should learn and so it becomes it's just sort of a smorgasbord of uh, various topics that are selected based on does the vocabulary and the, the writing style, does it seem to be age appropriate? Um, so I think th there isn't really a regard for uh, what, is, what is actually appropriate to the children's level of knowledge uh, because the view is that, that that's not what we're trying to evaluate here. We're trying to evaluate their ability to comprehend as an isolated skill unto itself. One of the things that comes out in these anecdotes that she relates in the book, I think this is a powerful aspect of what she does in the knowledge gap. I think it, it really captures the, how this can be demotivating. So if we, earlier when we started the conversation, I said, this is such a value in human life to be able to learn to read and gain knowledge and, and just all the pleasure you might get from literature and independent of just getting knowledge, the way it opens your horizons to other experiences and, and other people's ways of thinking and, and just deepens your understanding of human nature, human psychology. It just it, it, It's almost an endless realm of values that you can explore just on the side of fiction. And then of course, the, so much knowledge uh, continually growing all the time. And my, my observation from reading the, the this section where she discusses how teachers are going about with this content, di skills divorced from content approach to reading, it's, it's almost as if it's calculated to destroy motivation. And I don't think that's the, t I don't think if you ask those teachers, are you trying to get these kids to become avid readers? I think their answer is gonna be yes. But the reality of the method that they're instructing their students with it's exactly the opposite. And I don't think it's avoidable. I think it has to be that if you talk to a five-year-old, a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, and this is what you tell them reading looks like and what you're supposed to do, I don't think that's going to work just from the experience I've had with children that age. And I think the evidence is that it doesn't work and it can't work because it doesn't connect with the child. And it's, it, I don't think it's, um, it actually gives them the skills that they would need. So if you, I don't want to put it in terms of skills, but it doesn't equip them to be able to pick up a book, devour it, and then stoke their their uh, desire for more. Uh, and, and to me, and I want to just step away from the way Wexel looks at it, because I think we should talk a bit about that, but it just this is not her perspective in the book, but it's the perspective I think the book provides evidence for, which is, uh, we talked about this in another context, but my view is that the, what's happening if you take this and, and sum it up what's happening is this is a, a really serious moral crime and and the the responsibility for it i don't put it at the feet of the teachers i as i said i think that they're trying to do what they think is going to get students to read i think it's it it's a way in which the, the problem is rooted in a system that is it's insulated from a real market it doesn't have it's it's corrupted by certain ideas that become entrenched. This is the government-run state school system. And I think more broadly than the government-run schools, it's I think it, it permeates the whole education sphere. Wherever you work, even if it's a private school, it can permeate 
even the better schools or uh, whether they're however they're run but i think it's fundamentally rooted in the government system and it's hard to move this so in another i forget where we talked about this but it, we the the fact that knowledge about what what is effective instruction in reading it's not a new discovery i mean maybe it's being reinforced by more research maybe there's new aspects and refinements and nuances but the fundamental that as you were describing it that there is we have an alphabet and it matches certain sounds in our language and part of learning to read is gaining the facility to go back and forth and become fluent and then be able to put it together in your head and that is known and it's it's validated we, we don't <laughs> that isn't that should not be controversial and that that should that's missing and that isn't being done that is it, it's a the system that is now in place is ruining lives precisely because it's not giving them that basic minimum. And we talked earlier about how proficiency is, even that is a very low standard. But even if you held that as a standard, it's not even meeting that. And it, partly it's because it's, it's, it's hard to dislodge the existing methods, methods that are not working. And better methods are having, a, it's really hard for the advocates of better approaches to penetrate because of the way, and we don't have to get into the whole dynamics of that, but just it's a very hard problem to solve, but it, the moral dimension of it is the part I really wanted to underline, which is this isn't, it, it's easy to overlook that when we talk about 33%, 35% are proficient and all the ones who are not proficient, those are individuals whose lives are, either ruined or hampered and that is that is wrong like if you're in the response if your role is to be an educator or a system that's supposed to be educating students and this is the outcome i don't think it, i think looking at the data can can mask the reality that it's individuals and their lives that matter and that they're being it's worse than being shortchanged it's it's really a, it's a crime against each of them uh, and I think that's, that, I, don't, I just want to make clear, that's not what you get from Wexler, but I think what her book uh, supports is, is that kind of perspective in terms of the evidence of some of what's going on. Um, I'm curious of your reaction, and I think it's useful to get a sense of how does Wexler think about this and where does she land up in terms of what, where to go from here? Yeah, uh, so I think you mentioned the uh, the way that this wrong ideas in education get entrenched in the government system and that there's a kind of an educational establishment that uh, thrives on the, the lack of competition and permeates education in other areas. I think we'd also be remiss not to mention uh, teachers colleges or schools of education at universities, which is where most teachers, almost all public school teachers go uh, to get their degree, which they in most states have to have in order to become a teacher. And there's really an orthodoxy that's entrenched in those institutions. And one of the, I mean, one of the interesting points Wexler brings up in the book is that the, those are actually insulated from other university departments. So even though, you know, I think there is this scientific research being done about different methods of reading, it doesn't even make its way into the schools of education because they're, they're insulated off from other university departments. But more fundamentally, yeah, I think there's a there's a wrong perspective about what education should be doing, what matters most in education that is entrenched in those departments is being taught to all aspiring teachers who go through those programs and then become teachers, become administrators, uh, and it perpetuates in that way. And the, one of the sad ironies, I think, of this is that one of the... Uh, tenets of this kind of the establishment orthodox view in in education right now is that uh and part of the the source of the the hostility to having a lot of content teaching a lot of knowledge is that uh they're they think that that is inherently associated with the, a model of education where the children just sit in rows and engage in rote memorization the teachers just drilling uh content into their minds and they're just memorizing things and it's boring and it's uh, dis, you know disciplinarian there's an authoritarian view of what that looks like and it's it, it's just it, their view is that this is so demotivating we have to get away from this we have to get to a model that encourages children to think for themselves 
and be creative and learn skills as opposed to just memorizing stuff and having it by authority and not really understanding what they're learning. Um, and we can, you know, we can, you can debate the, how the merits of some of the criticisms of a very highly structured, highly rigid model of education, but the way in which the advocates of creativity, self-expression have held what that means and have implemented that in schools is that they emptied them of content and created this system where we're just trying to teach skills. We're just trying to teach how to think and not, and not what to think, not any information, not any knowledge of the world. Just, just read some different stuff and, you know, learn the skills of reading and, and think creatively, but we're not going to give you any material that you can use to, uh, you know, to exercise your creativity on in this quest to, create something that's more motivating, more uh, interesting to the children, they've created something that I could not imagine being more demotivating is sitting down a bunch of first graders and saying, we're going to learn about captions and we're going to learn about how to find the main idea. And no, don't look at the pictures right now. We're not learning about any of that animals and planets and, uh, ancient history and those things. No, like just find the main idea and, and tell me which one of these is the caption and uh, help me find this in the index. It's, it's so demotivating and it's, it's so, it, I mean, I think it really becomes absurd when you think about the idea that our goal is to change education so that children are excited and energized and they, they get to learn things that interest them and you're going to take away all the content all the information and i mean anyone who's encountered a, a child of the elementary school age has experienced that they want to know about the world they have so many questions they want to know a lot about the world and uh the idea that in the name of motivation in the name of uh you know appealing to the the interests of the child we're going to end up with a system that empties the schools of all content and has them learning these skills, these strategies. It's, it's an, it's an absurd and a sad irony, as I said, that it came out of a, a movement that was promoted as being about having a more motivating method of education. If I remember correctly from the argument she lays out, or at least her exposition of the opposing view in the book, there seems to be an aspect of the view that she's criticizing that children need to, I think the way she puts it is they need to learn to read before they can read to learn something along those lines. And therefore what one implication of that is they're not ready for content. They're not ready for history. They're not ready for science. They're not ready for those things. Let's just teach them how to, to, to read with these so-called skills, which are essentially here's the caption or, or as it's des described in those anecdotes, at least it's, it's this unmotivating uh, uh, skill of that, that doesn't really mesh. And as you put it, I think it's absurd. And one of the things that she, I think it's an offhand comment she makes, but it, it, I think it goes directly to the point you're raising, which is go meet a five-year-old. <laughs> I remember when my children were at a certain age, that they're, it's a constant stream of whys and questions and it's, it doesn't end. And the more that you can fuel that, the more I think you're doing your job as an educator. And anything that is, is in effect sapping that, I think is counter uh, to the goal. And but one of the things that comes up is that it's not, there isn't, I don't think it's, <laughs> I don't think it's plausible that children are not ready for certain subjects. The question is, do you know how to teach it to them? So the, the it seems like an, a false alternative between, oh, they're not ready for content yet. We have to do these, these sort of practice methodological skills sort of thing. Once they have these skills, then they can go to content. And, and one of the things she mentions in passing is that in the Montessori approach, which is uh, based on the theories of Maria Montessori, the children at a very young age get both, but it's not presented as separate things. It's that they learn about the world and the history. There's these great stories and they're told in di different levels of abstraction at different ages. And, uh, and it's, it's presented in a way that's interesting and accessible 
or maybe a, a better term for this is age appropriate. So, it, and children lap it up because it, it's interesting and it's a story and it's, there's, there's, it leads to other kinds of quests for knowing things. So what this reminds me of is that there, there's, there's a host of the theory. This is not our focus today, but it's relevant to talk about just in passing is that a lot of these fights or the, this kind of perspective on reading versus uh, uh, content and, and it doesn't strike me as well rooted in any observed uh, data. <laughs> and, and it doesn't strike me as really concerned with learning more about how children learn and studying the sort of the reality of it. And, and uh, it, it's a case, it, it comes across at least, and I'd have to look into this more, but it comes across as, well, we have this theory and we're going to just drive this theory until we're done with it and to hell with the results, to hell with what the reality is. This is what we're going to do. And it, it has the feel not of a validated and successful approach because it's not successful. And it, there's real questions about what the basis of it is. Um, but it's in defiance of the goal. It, it, do you really think kids are going to come out of this loving to read? Are you going to create lifelong learners as a result of this because of their exposure to captions and figuring out where these, these obscure things that they're so incidental to the, to the whole purpose of reading? Um, what if they don't have pictures in the book? What happens then? What, what's, what's the, how's it going to help you to know what a caption is when you're reading more sophisticated stuff? So it's this defiance of the fundamental perspective that you're trying to cultivate these minds who are hungry for knowledge. And that's, that's easy to validate. As I said, you just need to talk to a child at an age and, and just see how they pepper you with questions. Uh, and I think this goes back to the moral perspective. Like if this is what's happening, it's, I think it's difficult to walk away from this and not have a, an even worse view of the educational system. Uh, and again, it, it, I'm not parsing it out into particular teachers. That's not the point. The point is that if this is the outcome of a whole system and a bureaucracy, this can't be right. This, this is no way. And it's it's actually worse than can't be right. It's, it's really wrong and destructive. And one of the things I, I didn't think is effective in the, this isn't a, a whole analysis of Wexler's book, but just to take up this aspect, I think she does really well to surface this issue. I think it's important that she did it and that it's, it's to her credit. I worry that she has, she does not come down. Um, I think she lets people off too lightly in a certain way. And I know that's not the goal of the book, but I think it's difficult to engage in this topic and then be, uh, I, I, I don't want to mischaracterize her view, but I, I think it's important to take a perspective on the moral meaning of what's happening and, and not be too quick to let people off. And people, I mean, sort of the people who are responsible for the theories and pushing them and ignoring the evidence that's, that's contrary to their, their whole perspective. Uh, I'm just curious about how you, you view this. Yeah, I, I think that in a lot of educational reformers and not just Wexler, I've seen this attitude that it's, there's, the schools are pursuing really really wrong methods of teaching that are demonstrably wrong and that you can if you really pay attention and study a, not even a lot but some about what children are like and what they need and think about what would actually prepare them to live a a wonderful life uh that you would recognize that these theories are wrong uh th there's a there's an attitude often, I think, to treat that as an as an honest mistake. Like, oh, these people they just don't know any better. They they are mistaken. And I think I think there are times when you can say that. I mean, I'm I agree that like the the typical teacher who's gone to you know a highly respected uh, teachers college like Columbia, for example, and has has you know been taught by the people who are supposed to be the top experts in education. Here's how here's how you do it. Here's some reasons. Uh, now, it that I think is more in the area of an honest mistake, but someone whose job is to figure out how to teach children and what they come up with is, yeah, we're not going to teach them anything. We're not going to teach them any information. We're going to give them these little skills. We're not going to worry about, think about the content. 
uh, does, doesn't matter what is interesting to them. And we're not going to consider that, you know, maybe learning the content is actually really important to them actually being able to understand things that they will have to read later. Uh, the idea that someone can just you know, have as their job, their career, their responsibility to teach, to, you know, figure out how to teach children and just not acknowledge that and that that's just going to be an honest mistake. I, that beggars belief to me. And th there's a recent e example that illustrates this to me that um, it's not quite in this area of knowledge, but the, the uh, it's in the reading wars issue that one of the, uh, the leading gurus of whole language balanced literacy approach to reading uh, turned around uh, about a year ago and said, yeah, I've realized that I was wrong about all of my approaches and all of my methods and actually phonics is really important. And we need to, we need to bring back, we need to bring in some phonics. Actually, I've realized this finally, uh, after having for like 20 years sold a reading curriculum that had very limited phonics and was based on methods that a lot of people knew were wrong and were not, uh, were not good for children, were harming, hampering their ability to become successful readers. And I, some, some of education reformers have reacted to that as like, oh, okay, I think she was honestly mistaken. And, you know, I don't know what was going on in, in her mind, but I, I can't take that as like, oh, no harm, no foul. No, you sold a reading curriculum for years and years and years. And now you just suddenly came out and said, oh, actually, it turns out I didn't know anything about reading. It was your responsibility to know. Yeah, I, remember, I think I read this uh, story about this in the New York Times uh, some time ago, and I, I heard a bit more about the context. It, that is a good example of the kind of person who is in a position to know better. And as a th either theoretician or, or curriculum designer, however she thinks of herself, she's hugely influential. I mean, you're saying she was selling this curriculum. It was sold in major textbooks and publishers were bringing out year after year. That the person in that position is responsible for knowing what is going on in the field and for finding the evidence. And if there's evidence against your view, the rational and honest thing to do is not to stonewall it and not to ignore it, but to take it on and, and rethink. But and, I agree with your assessment from what I read. This was not a, uh, this was so overdue that this issue was settled so long ago in terms of the, the basis for it. Um, maybe we should include a link to that uh, article in, or some something on this in the show notes. I should probably wind up the conversation. Did you have any final thoughts? I have a few things I want to suggest for people to go and read, but did you have any closing remarks? Um, I don't have anything specific to add. I just, since we've been talking about that article, if, if, yeah, we can put it in the show notes, but if people are looking for it, if you search the, the, the name of the person we're talking about is Lucy Calkins. I, I didn't want to make it seem like I was hiding her name anyway, since I'm being so critical. Um, if, if you look up her name, you can probably find the article as well. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. We should maybe do another conversation around that because I think that, that both what happened there and the reaction to it is interesting precisely because of what the stakes are. And that goes to the sort of the core issue that we, that we raised at the beginning. Well, why do we, what, what is there at stake here? I think there's much more than people are willing to, people realize and much, much more in terms of the value significance for individual lives that are ruined or hobbled in significant ways that Th that all of that is masked by having low standards and not realizing that this system is not just failing at a level of statistical significance it's it's failing individuals and and destroying their potential to succeed in life and achieve the happiness that they're that each of us should be free to pursue and and succeed and the, for another conversation as well, there are real problems that this leads to culturally and economically for the people who are hampered with this way, and that that are really not well understood in the sense that the, the blame for those problems, cultural, political kinds of problems, are, are put in the wrong place. And so there's another way in which the education system gets off too lightly um, 
but that's a conversation for another time. I, uh, I hate to be cryptic, but I, I think that's going to take us too far afield. Um, I thought that what would be helpful for people, so we've mentioned that Lucy Colkin's article is peripheral to the topic. Uh, I think Natalie Wexel's book is interesting to engage in. It's, you should have taken from our conversation, you could tell me your view, uh, there's, there's really interesting material in her book. It's not that our, our view, my view is not, I, I agree with everything in it. I think it's, it does a, a good job of surfacing this issue and it presents, it, it opens up important aspects of a, of a uh, situation that doesn't, really doesn't get the attention it deserves. So in that respect, it's worth reading. It's not the case that uh, she... I don't think all of her solutions are the right solutions or even her analysis or evaluations are correct, but I think in the sense of bringing up some of these, uh, some of the data, it's important. I thought that for people interested in this topic, a couple of things to look at that provide a much wider framework for thinking about education that I found useful. Um, and I think that people listening will as well. Ayn Rand has an essay called the Compra Chicos. The title is, if you've never heard about where that comes from, it's opaque. It's actually an analysis, an in-depth essay. It's one of our longer pieces on the American school system viewed philosophically in the sense of what are the philosophic influences that have informed it and uh, at the time she was writing. And she identifies a major influence being the progressive movement, which is allied with uh, the pr pragmatist school of philosophy in America. Those are not the only things, but those are significant factors. And she traces out what does that look like? What does the progressive education look like? How does it impact the mind of a, of a student? And what does that look like on a culture-wide scale? And it's damning, <laughs> to put it mildly. The Compa Chicos is a reference to a band of people in a novel that she uh, refers to by Victor Hugo, who distort purposely the bodies of children to make them into sideshow freaks, essentially. That's the very short summary of what the Compachicos are about. And part of her claim is that the progressive influenced education system in America, as she observed and as she demonstrates, is doing is distorting the minds or it's really crippling the minds of students in fundamental ways, not in in uh, so sort of at a philosophical fundamental level. So it's a very strong claim. And I think it's important for reading, it's important to read this to get a perspective on both how she thinks of what is the value of education, how significant it is and what are the stakes involved. And both, it's just a masterful analysis of how ideas shape institutions, particularly an institution that is itself an organ of spreading ideas, education. And it's, it's a uniquely important uh, role in the society. So I highly recommend that for people who have not engaged with that, or if they have, it's worth revisiting. And then the other one is an essay by Dr. Leonard Peikoff that I believe it, it was based on a talk he gave at the Ford Hall Forum. It's called The American School, Why Johnny Can't Think. And that's a, a riff. The subtitle is a riff on a book from the 1950s called Why Johnny Can't Read by Rudolf Flesch, which is which also worth reading for other reasons, but uh, for another time. Dr. Peikoff's essay is uh, his analysis of what he observed. He went to a number of schools and he, tries to, he, and he brings out what are the philosophical uh, influences on the schools and why they're not working. Because this is, 20, I forget what the year this came out. This is the late 80s, I think, mid to late 80s. Uh, and it, so this is an ongoing issue, what the state of education is, but it's really insightful. I think it's worth revisiting as to, to help frame some of the issues in education that are still with us today. Um, so those are some recommendations uh, I think people might be interested in. Yeah, and one thing one thing that I think is interesting about uh, Dr. Peikoff's article is uh, an issue that comes up in Wexler's book but isn't discussed, I think, thoroughly is uh, I mean, she talks a lot about how knowledge is important. And uh, a point she makes fairly briefly is that really an important part is that knowledge is related to other knowledge. So if we're thinking about, I mean, we talked a little bit about reading to learn earlier. Uh, the way that that actually works is that you read something that it assumes that some knowledge that you have and then teaches you new things. So there's a, there are relationships among knowledge. Dr. Peikoff's article, uh, The American School, Why Johnny Can't Think, 
really gives a philosopher's perspective on the structure of knowledge and how important it is for education that knowledge be taught in a sequence structured way uh, according to the to the nature of how human knowledge works and so that that's a really interesting aspect of of that article in light of uh, our conversation today uh, so maybe do you want to tell us what's happening next week on the podcast sure yeah next week uh, i will be back along with uh, ben bayer to talk about uh, some controversies that are going on in the uh, the higher education world in the state of florida uh, and particularly you may have heard that the governor Ron DeSantis has nominated some conservatives to the board of a small uh, liberal arts college called New College. And that has prompted some controversy because they're really trying to shake things up, really trying to fundamentally change the nature of this institution. And there are some other ways in which DeSantis is uh, trying to change higher education in Florida that we may discuss as well. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe, click the bell. We'd love for you to uh, leave a comment and share this with other people so that we can reach new minds and new, uh, larger audience. Same thing. If you're watching on other platforms, engage with us, click like, and so forth. And if you have questions or comments about new ideal live, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address is new ideal at einrand.org. We welcome questions, we welcome comments, feedback, suggestions. Often we take them and build episodes around them. We read everything. We'll try to respond to many, but don't, please don't be disappointed if you don't get a, a personal re reply. We might reply to you by other ways. And I think that's everything for now. We'll see you next time. Thanks.